If you go back to Muhammad's time, he only had a couple of basic arguments. One was the argument from literary excellence. Well, it's just my title for it. But the argument is that the Quran is so amazing, it must come from God. Uh, the literary excellence of the Quran is so um, uh, wonderful that it must come from God. And that is a, just a, an absolutely silly argument. It would be you know, comparable to saying that Mozart's music is so wonderful, it must be from God. Uh, it's not a good argument. Um, and the other argument that was, was most popular during Muhammad's time was claiming that the Bible contains prophecies about him. So if Muhammad is talking to the pagans, well, it was, my book is so wonderful, my poetry is so great, it must be from God. Really strange argument. And if he's talking to Jews or Christians, it's, well, the Bible contains prophecies about me when Muhammad's teachings contradict the Bible. So it's a very odd claim to make. So those are the arguments Muhammad used, and they're not very good arguments. In fact, they're, they're both horrible, horrible, horrible arguments. And so it's not surprising that Muslims have, in our modern times, chosen a, a very different path. And the claim that is most common nowadays is that the Quran and Muhammad's teachings are scientifically miraculous, that Muhammad knew things about science, about the world and uh, human beings and life that just couldn't have been known by anyone during his time and weren't known for centuries later. And that this is how we can know that he must have been a prophet because he must have been getting this from God. And the reason that this is successful is Muslims use this without, uh, without people actually doing the work of investigating whether it's true or not. So uh, this argument is geared towards gullible people who aren't going to take the time to examine the Quran and examine the Hadith and determine whether uh, these claims are true or not. But we're not like that. We actually want to examine uh, what Islam has to say about science to see whether it is accurate so we know whether this argument is a good one or not. Now, j just, to be, uh, you know, just, to, just to put this out there, I don't really care that Muhammad was uh, so incredibly wrong about lots of scientific topics. That wouldn't be an important reason for, um, for rejecting him. Um, you know, I would say he's, you know, if he's in the seventh century, uh, he's talking to a seventh century audience, I wouldn't have much problem with him. Uh, you know, uh, saying things according to the beliefs of the time, but it's the Muslims. It's Muslims who are saying that it's through the scientifically accurate Quran and statements by Muhammad that we know that Islam is true. And if that's how we know that Islam is true, well, what now we have to deal with all these uh, completely scientifically absurd statements in the Quran and the Hadith. And so we'll, we'll go through some of those in this program, and we'll see how far we get. But we have, there's, we could go on endlessly with problems uh, in the Quran and the Hadith. But let's start with Muhammad's view of the universe. So Muhammad has a certain view of the universe that's laid down in the Quran and in the teachings of Muhammad. And at the bottom of everything, uh, we find, uh, in, well, let, let's go ahead and read it. Um, but we'll read a verse of the Quran, and then we'll look at the understanding of the people who were there. Chapter 68, verse 1 of the Quran says, Nun, by the pen and by the record which men write. So what's that Nun mean? Here we say, well, we don't know what it means, but uh, according to Muhammad's, one of Muhammad's companions, Ibn Abbas, they knew what it meant. This is the tafsir of Ibn Abbas on this, this Nun, what Allah is swearing by. Uh, he says, Allah swears by the Nun which is the whale that carries the earths on its back while in water, and beneath which is the bull, and under the bull is the rock, and under the rock is the dust, and none knows what is under the dust save Allah. So let's look at that in reverse. You have dust, and above that you have the rock, and above that you have the bull, and above that you have uh, the water, and there's the whale in the water, and on the whale, uh, that's what's carrying the earths. Right now, you should be looking at, looking at this saying, well, that's, that's what the Quran meant here, according to the people who are around Muhammad. So these are the people who know Muhammad, who are asking him questions about what the Quran means, and that's their understanding of what the Quran is saying here by, uh, by the Nun, which is this giant whale or giant fish that's carrying the earths on its back. And yes, you heard correctly, you heard earths, earths, plural. There's not just one earth. Let's see what he means here. This is chapter 65, verse 12 of the Quran. Allah is he who created seven heavens 
and of the earth the like of them. So there are seven heavens, and there are the same number of earths. There are seven earths. And Muhammad actually explains what he means here in uh, Jamiat Termidi 3298. We read, then Muhammad said, do you know what is under you? So Muhammad's talking to people, and he says, do you know what's under you? So obviously the earth is under them. He says, do you know what is under you? They said, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, indeed, it is the earth. Pretty obvious there, he got that right. And then he said, do you know what is under that? Now notice, we, we know that under, you know, if you're standing, then obviously the earth is under you. So that's something that everyone would have known, and that's something that Muhammad got right. But now he's going to say what's under that. So we have an opportunity to test whether he's making a, a scientifically accurate statement. So he said, do you know what is under that? They said, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, verily below it is another earth, between the two of which is a distance of 500 years, until he enumerated seven earths. And he said, between every two earths is a distance of 500 years. So you've got one earth, and then below that you have another earth with a, with a space in between them of 500 years, and below that another earth with, with a space of 500 years. And whether he means like a 500-year journey or any way you want to interpret this, 500-year you know, uh, walking, 500-year you know, uh, camel journey, however you want to interpret it, or 500 uh, years, 500, whatever you want to call this, right? That is not true. It is not true that there's one earth and then, uh, and then uh, you know, this 500-year this journey um, and then there's another earth. That's just, that's just absolute nonsense. We know that's not true, but that's what Muhammad said. And his followers... His followers are, are completely convinced that he knows what's going on here, that he knows the structure of the universe. And we, well, they didn't know any better, but we do. And Muhammad is wrong. And so here we have the Quran. Muhammad is considered in Islam the greatest interpreter of the Quran. Muhammad says, here's what this means by these seven earths. And he's just completely wrong. And yet, Science confirms Islam somehow. Well, well, how is that? Muhammad is getting, getting everything wrong so far, except for you know, basic information like there is an earth below you. Once he goes beyond the obvious, he gets everything wrong. Let's keep looking. It's also important to note that the earth is flat. Muhammad believes in a flat earth. And let's look at a couple of passages here. Uh, chapter 20, verse 53 of the Quran he who has made for you the earth like a carpet spread out. So the earth is like a carpet spread out. Chapter 71, verse 19 of the Quran, and Allah has made the earth for you as a carpet spread out. So again, the earth is like a carpet. And you're supposed to reflect on this, on this flat nature of the earth to tell you something. Uh, chapter 88, verses 17 through 20 of the Quran. Do they never reflect on the camels and how they were created, the heaven, how it was raised on high, the mountains, how they were set down, the earth, how it was made flat. The earth was made flat, according to the Quran. Now, it's, uh, you know, if you take modern translations, which are made for a Western audience, they will try to retranslate that to avoid the obvious error. But when we go back to earlier Islamic commentators, they point out that they know what the Arabic word here means, and it means laid out flat. Let me give you an example. Tafsir of Jalalain, one of the most popular Islamic commentaries of all time, comments on this verse. As for his words, sutahat, laid out flat, this on a literal reading suggests that the earth is flat, which is the opinion of most of the scholars of the revealed law, so experts in Islam or Sharia, and not a sphere as astronomers have it, even if this does not contradict any of the pillars of the law. So notice what he says here. The experts in Islam, the experts in Sharia, the experts in Islamic law, they know that the earth is flat because of what the Quran says. It's the astronomers who are saying that it's a sphere. But the astronomers, they're getting it wrong because they don't know, they, they don't, they don't know the Quran well enough. So notice, he's putting a division here. There's the, the experts in Islam, they know the earth is flat because of what the Quran says. And then you have the actual scientists, they, know the, they say the earth is a sphere, but they, they, uh, they got it wrong. So he's pointing out that it's the Islamic scholars who know the truth, and the scientists, they just get it wrong. Tafsir of Ibn Amas, commenting on the seven uh, heavens. Allah it is who has created the seven heavens, and Ibn Abbas adds, one above the other like a dome, and of the earth the like thereof, seven earths, but they are flat. So it's not just one earth, it's not just our earth that is flat, 
It's all seven of the earths. So basically, the structure of these seven earths, according to Muhammad, not according to me, is that you have seven earths that are kind of stacked up, stacked up like pancakes, uh, but with a space of 500 years in between each one of them. So you have these seven sort of uh, floating earths with a 500-year journey in between them. And I mean, you know this isn't true, right? If you know anything about science, if you, if you took elementary school science, you know this is wrong. And yet, it's supposedly science that somehow confirms that Islam is the truth. And we can only wonder, you know, how can we possibly make sense of this? So, you have the seven earths, but notice uh, Ibn Abbas says there's also the seven heavens, and that, that's what the Quran said, but there are the seven heavens, and they're like domes. Well, that's interesting, because we have the earths, and then we have the domes. We'll get to that in a moment. Chapter 36, verses 38 to 40 of the Quran. And the sun runs its course for a period determined for it. That is the decree of, uh, of him, the exalted and might, the all-knowing. And the moon we have measured for it mansions to traverse till it returns like the old and withered lower part of a date stock. It is not permitted to the sun to catch up to the moon, nor can the night outstrip the day. Each just swims along in its own orbit, according to law. So according to the Quran, the sun and the moon are kind of uh, 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 chasing each other, and the sun just uh, can't catch up to the moon. Well, and they both have their orbit. So according to the Quran, you have the earth, and the sun and the moon are orbiting, uh, but one can't actually catch up to the other. Now, that's not correct. You have the sun, and you have the earth uh, going around the sun, and the moon going around the earth. It's not both the sun and the moon chasing each other around the earth, as the Quran declares. Chapters 18, verses 83 to 86. This is another place where we can, um, we can examine what Muhammad said to determine if he actually knows, because Muhammad tells people where the sun goes when it sets. Lots of people didn't know that at his time, so we can test him to see if he gets it right. Well, here's what the Quran says. Chapter 18, verses 83 to 86. They ask you concerning Dual Karnain. There's the dispute of who this refers to. Many commentators will say that it refers to Alexander the Great. They ask you concerning Dual Karnain. Say, I will rehearse to you something of his story. Verily, we established his power on earth, and we gave him the ways and the means to all ends. One such way he followed until, when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a spring of murky water. Near it he found a people. So, Dual Karnain reached the place where the sun sets, and he found it set, he found the sun set in a, in a spring of murky water. And people live there. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that's correct? Do you believe there's a spring somewhere where the sun goes down and goes into a, a pool of murky water and the people live there? Uh, because it's wrong. Muhammad got it wrong, and it's obviously wrong, and so Muslims are forced to try and reinterpret these things. But, I mean, think about it. What is Muhammad getting right here? Apart from there's an earth below you, what is he getting right? There is a sun, there is a moon. Apart from the obvious that any uh, you know, six-year-old could have told you, what is he getting right? He's getting everything that he, he could possibly get wrong, wrong. And yet it's science that confirms Islam. Again, only if you don't bother to actually read the sources. Chapter 37, verses 6 through 10 of the Quran. What are stars? Well, Muhammad's going to tell us. We have indeed decked the lower heaven with beauty in the stars for beauty and for guard against all obstinate, rebellious, evil spirits. So they should not strain their ears in the direction of the exalted assembly, but be cast away from every side, repulsed, for they are under a perpetual penalty, except such as snatch away something by stealth, and they are pursued by a flaming fire of piercing brightness. Think about this. Allah says, we have, in, we have decked the lower heaven with beauty in the stars. So here's what the stars are. For beauty and for guard against all obstinate rebellious spirits. The stars are to guard heaven from evil spirits. So they should not strain their ears in the direction of the exalted assembly. So that they don't sneak into, an, into paradise and hear what Allah is saying. Hear what Allah is planning. But if they do, except, as such, snatch, except such as snatch away something by stealth. So... Sometimes they actually get there and they hear something, they hear some of Allah's secrets, and they are pursued by a flaming fire of piercing brightness. So Allah hurls one of the stars at him, because these are what guard uh, paradise against 
um, against these evil spirits. But if they get something and they, they start trying to run away with the information that they heard, that they overheard, they are pursued by uh, a, flame, uh, a flaming fire. That's a shooting star. So when you see a shooting star, it's because Allah became angry at a demon who stole some information and Allah hurled a star at him. Let's, let's read one more. There, there are several verses, passages of the Quran that talk about the stars being missiles. Let's read one more just so you don't think I'm misinterpreting that. Chapter 67, verse 5. And we have from of old adorned the lowest heaven with lamps, and we have made such lamps as missiles to drive away the evil ones and have prepared for them the penalty of the blazing fire. So uh, stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons when they try to sneak into paradise. And when you see a shooting star, it's because Allah shot one of these stars at a demon who stole some information. So Allah uh, shoots the demons with one of his uh, star missiles. And that's what stars are. Now, th there are all kinds of problems with this. One, I mean, stars aren't up, stars aren't up there protecting uh, paradise from evil spirits trying to sneak in. Uh, but, I mean, even more obviously, uh, a shooting star is not an actual star. When you see a shooting star, someone in Muhammad's time might have thought that a shooting star is actually a star, and that's why we call them shooting stars, because it looks like a star is shooting. But a shooting star is not a star. It's a, you know, a chunk of debris that hits our atmosphere and then ignites. It's not an actual star. Muhammad didn't know that. The author of the Quran didn't know that. But if the author of the Quran were Allah, I would expect Allah to know what a shooting star is. Uh, but he just didn't. The author of the Quran didn't know this, and so I can't believe that this is actually God. Just in case, just in case we think there's uh, some other interpretation here, we have in Sahih al-Bukhari, number 3198, Abu Qatada, it's one of Muhammad's companions, uh, explains this verse, chapter 67, verse 5, stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons. Uh, he mentions this and he says, uh, he quotes Allah's saying, and indeed we have adorned the nearest heaven with lamps, that's ch chapter 67, verse 5, and Abu Qatada says, the creation of these stars is for three purposes. And they are, one, as decoration of the nearest heaven, two, as missiles to hit the devils, and three, as signs to guide travelers. So, if anybody tries to find a different interpretation, he is mistaken and just wastes his efforts and troubles himself with what is beyond his limited knowledge. Notice, he had the same sort of mentality that we read about in Tafsir Jalalain. Uh, in Tafsir Jalalain, remember, uh, the Quran says the earth is flat, so who cares what those astronomers say? Here, we're told, Look, the Quran has explained what, the per what these stars are. Anyone, anyone who tries to seek any, so other, any other sort of understanding, in other words, if you actually plan to do scientific research to determine what stars are, he says he is mistaken and just wastes his efforts and troubles himself with, it, with what is beyond his limited knowledge. In other words, don't even try to understand anything but what the Quran tells you. Don't try to understand it. It's a waste of time. This is Islam. This is the Islam of Muhammad and his companions. Jamia at Termidi, number 3298. Then Muhammad said, do you know what is above you? So think about this. We've got what's down at the bottom. You've got the dust and the whale and all that stuff. And then you've got the seven earths stacked up on each other. And then we know that you know, the sun and the moon are circling this, this earth and that the sun sets in a pool of murky water. And then now you have the, the stars, which are uh, missiles that God uses to shoot demons when they try to hear something in paradise. And what's above that? Jamia at Termini, number 3298. Then Muhammad said, do you know what is above you? They said, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, indeed, it is a preserved canopy of the firmament whose surge is restrained. Then he said, do you know how much is between you and between it? They said, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, between you and it is the distance of 500 years. Then he said, do you know what is above that? They said, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, verily, above that are two heavens. Between the two of them, there is a distance of 500 years, until he enumerated seven earths. What is between each of the two heavens is what is in between the heavens and the earth. So you, we, we've already seen you have, um, you have the seven earths stacked up like pancakes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's Muhammad explaining what is below us, what's below us, because the Quran says that there are seven earths and there are seven heavens. What does he mean? Well, Muhammad is the one who gets to explain that. There are seven earths stacked up like pancakes, except with a 500-year journey in between them. 
And then he explains what's above them. And there are seven heavens that are actually st stacked up like domes on top of each other. And there are seven of them. So is this correct? Because notice he says that there is a journey of 500 years in between each one of these domes. But it's the same 500 year journey that's in between each one of the earths. So again, whatever, whatever kind of journey you want to call that, the, the, the 500 years that's in between it, whatever you want to call it, if you want to say it's, it's 500 years on foot, it's 500 years on riding a camel, it's 500 years by horse, it's 500 years by train, it's 500 years by jet, by spaceship, whatever you want to call that 500 year journey, is there another earth that's 500 years away from our flat earth? No, our earth is not flat, and there's certainly not another, uh, another earth 500 year journey away, we'd be able to see that. We'd be able to, to detect that. And uh, again, whatever sort of journey you want to mean by this 500 years, is there some other heaven that's a 500 year journey uh, right above us? So you have a dome, and then you have another 500 year journey, and, and there's another dome above that. Is that true? What could that possibly mean that would be true? Interpret that for me in any way that would make that true. And there is nothing that would make that true. You, you don't get to any sort of, any sort of uh, uh, structure or object above us, and then there's another one above that, and there's another, another one above that. We live in a very massive universe, and there is no 500-year journey that uh, would fit this description and make Muhammad's teachings accurate. So Muhammad is just getting everything that can, he could possibly get wrong, wrong. You couldn't invent something this wrong. If you sat back and thought, let me come up with the most ridiculous view of the universe that I could think of, you would not be able to beat Muhammad. His view is far more absurd than anything you can come up with. And yet, it's through science that we know that Islam is true. Let's keep going. Chapter 22, verse 65 of the Quran. Do you not see that Allah has made subservient to you whatever is in the earth, and the ships running in the sea by his command, and he withholds the heaven from falling on the earth, except with his permission, most surely Allah is compassionate, merciful to men. Notice what Allah just said. And he withholds the heaven from falling on the earth, except with his permission. The heaven is a solid object, according to Islam, that would fall on us if Allah weren't holding it up. Is that true? Is the sky above us a solid object that would fall on us if Allah weren't holding it up? So when he talks about these seven heavens that are stacked on top of each other, he's talking about some sort of solid domes that he is holding in place. And if he weren't, they would just fall on us. Is that correct? Of course it's not correct. And once again, Muhammad is getting everything that he could possibly get wrong, wrong. Let's read another verse of the Quran. Chapter 34, verse 9. See they not what is before them and behind them of the sky and the earth? If we wished, we could cause the earth to swallow them up or cause a piece of the sky to fall on them. So again, the sky, the sky above you, when you look up in the sky, Muhammad doesn't know that that's mostly empty space with you know, some, some stars up there. Muhammad believes that there are these, uh, these seven solid domes above you and if Allah weren't holding up the domes, of course, we've already seen that they would fall on us. But even then, Allah can allow a piece of the heaven, the sky, to fall on us if he wanted to. So if he wants you to die, he can either have the earth swallow you up, or he could have a, a chunk of the sky, which he doesn't seem to know is empty space. He could have a chunk of that just fall on you. So, you know, the earth, uh, I mean, the, the earth has these domes above it, and a piece of that dome could just fall on you if Allah wanted. So these are actually solid objects. You have your seven earths that are stacked up, and you have the domes above that, and Allah's holding them up. At any time, he could, let a, he could let a piece of that dome fall on top of you and crush you, but, you know, hopefully he doesn't. That's the Quran. This is the scientifically accurate Quran. Let's look at one more, because we, we, we sort of looked all the way at the bottom, and we've gone up step by step to see, you know, the, go through the earths and than what is above them, and now there's something that's on top of everything. Muhammad tells us, Sunan Abu Daud, number 4705. Muhammad said, above the seventh heaven, so this is above the seven domes, above the seventh heaven, there is a sea, 
The distance between whose surface and bottom is like that between one heaven and the next. Above that, here is some great information, some great scientific information from you, for you. Above that, there are eight mountain goats. The distance between whose hoofs and haunches is like the distance between one heaven and the next. Then Allah, the blessed and the exalted, is above that. So you've got your seven heavens. Then there's a sea, the distance between whose surface and bottom is like that between one heaven and the next, so it's a 500-year journey. Above that, there are eight mountain goats, so massive mountain goats. The distance between whose hoofs and haunches is like the distance between one heaven and the next. So whatever you want to say that 500-year journey means, that the 500 years between each of the, the domes and between each of the earths, Keep in mind that whatever that distance is, you're saying there are goats that big. There are mountain goats that are that big. Muhammad says so. He's the prophet. He knows. So there are mountain goats that are that big. And then above them is Allah. So let's put all of this together. You've got seven earths. That's false. All of them are flat. That's false. They're stacked on top of each other like pancakes. That's false, except with the long distance between them. That's false. Out on the edge of the top earth is a pool. That's false. Where the sun sets. That's false. There are also seven heavens above the earths. That's false. And they're like domes that will fall on us if Allah doesn't hold them up. That's false. In the lowest heaven are the stars, which Allah uses to hurl at demons. That's false false. And all of this is sandwiched between a, a giant fish, that's false, and eight giant goats, that's false. What did Muhammad get right? Again, apart from there is an earth, there is uh, a sun, there is a moon, there are stars. Apart from the obvious that anyone could have told you, what did he get right? Nothing. Everything that he could possibly get wrong, he got wrong. So if Muslims are appealing to science to say, this is how we know that Islam is true, well, everything Muhammad said that he could get wrong, he got wrong. So if science is the judge in our um, assessment of Islam, if science is the way we're going to determine what's true or false with Islam, um, we have to say that if he got everything wrong, then... This certainly isn't any confirmation. If, and if science is the judge, then we have to say that Islam is false because he got everything wrong. Now, all we did here was look at Muhammad's view of the universe. There's much more we could look at um, than just the universe. We can look at Muhammad's view of, uh, uh, of reproduction or Muhammad's um, statements about hygiene. And we'll look at those on our next episode of Jesus or Muhammad.